Welcome, welcome everyone to the next section of the NASCA virtual conference. I'm seeing so many faces in front of me right now. I'm seeing Dustin, I'm seeing Bob, I'm seeing David, I'm seeing Tanya. It is so good to see your faces. So although we are not meeting in person, we are really trying to do our best here to recreate um, the NASCA experience. So with that, I'm really excited to kick off today. I'm gonna go over a couple of details and logistics about how we're gonna run this session. So first up, we're going to the next slide. Um, we want you to rename yourself. That's gonna kind of serve as your virtual name badge. So if you will actually hover over your name and rename yourself as your name in your state and then, or your organization, because we have both our public and private sector uh, joining us today. So then look around and see what other states and who else is joining us. All right. Also, we're gonna be using an interactive tool because we want the session to be really interactive. We've chosen today to use Zoom because we wanna see your faces and we want to try to recreate the connections of a NASCA event. So we're also gonna be using Slido. So what you'll do is you'll go to slido.com when we pull up a prompt and you will use the code NASCA20. And whenever you see that, a, a question will pop up in front of you, whatever question we are asking, and then you will answer the question. All right, so because we are also using video today, I encourage you to use chat to connect to other people. Also use physical affirmation since we can't hear everyone, um, jazz hands, hearts, uh, really trying to connect with other people. And then we're also going to be doing a Twitter contest today. So I know today uh, we've got lots of tech leaders on the call and we all love Twitter. Uh, so make sure to use Twitter Use the hashtag NASCA20 about one of your favorite things that you hear today. And we'll announce that at the end of the session. I also have to thank our NASCA corporate partners. They're who uh, make this event possible. And we are really honored now in a time uh, where during COVID and when we're doing this virtually that we could really lean into our corporate community, really our private sector partners. I also uh, want to thank our virtual working group who helped put all of this together, who thought so intentionally about what content we should be giving our members. All right. So I think with that, that uh, is all of my kind of housekeeping. I want to then hand it over to our Chris Liu, who's our former NASCA president, to formally welcome everyone. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody to NASCA's Summer Thought Leadership Series. It's great to see so many people signing in from around the country. If you've joined us for the previous session, you know NASCA is focused on connecting professionals in state government operations and engaging in rich conversations around the challenges and solutions facing us today. Specifically today, we want to focus on digitization and the use of digital technologies to transform functions to better serve citizens, as well as streamline the way in which we do our work for efficiency and effectiveness. Our speakers and panelists will target strategies to provide value producing opportunities in our states and how we innovate the world of work. Before we begin our panel presentation, let's gauge where, where you are in your state around digitization and modernization of IT especially during the global health pandemic. Richmond Studio, will you launch the Slido question for us, please? Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Chris. And so people I can see are plugging that in. All you have to do is go to slido.com, type in NASCA 20, and your answers will appear here in a word cloud. And it'll get larger or smaller based on how people are answering. So I'm seeing remote work, teleworking, workflow, telecommunications. Yeah, what other functions have benefited from IT modernization? Lots of telework. Feel free to play along here at home. Get out that phone, type in NASCA 20. Oh wow, vehicle management, workflow running errands during lunch. Lots of great answers coming in. 
We'll give it about 30 more seconds, Chris, and I'll hand it back to you. Great. HR, NASCA 20, document management, reduced real estate. Mm -hmm. All right, excellent, Chris. I'll hand it back to you. Great. Well, thanks everybody for participating. It's good to see your responses. You'll hear from our state panelists and how each of us has had to react during the pandemic, social justice movement, and economic crisis facing our states. Again, welcome to NASCA's Summer Thought Leadership Series. Take time to meet a new colleague and find ways to continue the connections. Connections. After the series has been con concluded. Jamie will introduce our state chief administrators and moderate for today's panel. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. And you guys will get to hear a little bit more about Chris um, here on our panel in just a minute. So I'm gonna introduce our four amazing panelists. We've got Ace Callwood, who is going to uh, moderate this session. But today we're gonna hear, we're gonna also hear from Chris Liu, who's the Director of Department of Enterprise Services in Washington. We're gonna hear from Michael Newsom, the Secretary of Administration in Pennsylvania. We're also gonna hear from his CIO in Pennsylvania, John McMillan, and as well as the CIO who is stepping in, we had our member Josh Jabell, who was um, also dealing with some storms that came in Connecticut, but we have his CIO, uh, Mark Raymond, who is going to um, fill in in his place on this panel. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ace, who's gonna be moderating this session. Ace, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm uh, just really excited to dive in to this conversation. And of course, the name of the game for today is citizen centric uh, and the idea of putting our constituents or our citizens first as we consider technology specifically for this panel. So, you know, as we gathered this crop or this group of just amazing panelists and, um, you know, these these folks, we, we've got an incredible group, thought leaders, uh, discussing emerging technology. So I want to kick off with just a baseline, uh, and I'm going to head to Mark for this one. First question out of the gate, um, I'd love to understand the scope and scale of your digital portfolio, uh, and then the priorities of digital strategy and your approach, particularly as it's been affected by the global pandemic we're in the midst of. So uh, Mark, you can kick us off, take two or three minutes to just share what you all are thinking about in Connecticut. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ace. And, and it's great to be with you. You know, uh, Commissioner Jabal is my boss and sends along his uh, regards. We have 40% of the power in the state of Connecticut out right now. And uh, he's, uh, you know, at, at the head of our response team trying to uh, restore services. So, um, you know, when, when Governor Lamont came into office in 2019, one of his first state of the state or budget addresses was really around the need to have more of our services online. And, and that really set for us in motion uh, what, what we had been conceiving, but, but hadn't yet had some broad buy-in to, to undertake, which was uh, the launching of a, a Connecticut digital service. So uh, through the last year, we uh, ran a, an RFP process, created a small team, and, and, and actually launched our first product, which um, is the Connecticut Business One Stop uh, just last week. Uh, so, you know, that was the foundational goal, but, you know, the, the pandemic created for us a whole new set of challenges that we were able to apply our digital acumen to, uh, to solve some problems. And so, uh, we, you know, besides creating the, the new digital uh, office services, we, we did quite a bit around paying attention to uh, what our, our citizens were telling us around the, the pandemic. So we um, developed a coronavirus page and, and redesigned it three times, uh, taking into account a, a lot uh, the user feedback about what they needed to hear, um, what was changing in our environment. So, you know, first it was around masks and school closings, and then it was business closings and then reopenings. Um, so, you know, each time that we turned the crank and, and you know, additional information or, or became relevant, we used what citizens were asking about on our um, 
on our website, through our chatbot, uh, to, to reform the kind of information that, that we were providing for them. And I think that's a great way to understand what, how we're approaching digitization and digital services in Connecticut, right? Our, our guiding principles are really to listen to what our users are saying. Uh, we spent a lot of our history running our technology through our agency programs, and, and that does a great job for the program, but it doesn't do a great job for their citizen or our residents or our constituents or our businesses. Uh, so we're doing, uh, we're listening to them through user research, through analytics on the web, uh, but building uh, to really a, a, a sense of empathy with our, uh, our constituents in mind. Um, our next piece that's really important as a guiding principle to us is to hide the seams between our programs and agencies. Uh, citizens, residents, they don't care which agency they need to interact with. And so our digital presence needs to help make that go away and, and have them accomplish what they came to do, not just how we're organized. So really disguising our organizational structures with technology as a way of breaking down silos. Um, awesome. Mark, the, the, I, yep. oh, sorry, did I cut you off? Uh, yeah, two, two, two other just quick things was, you know, a focus on accessibility, Ace, you know, really using our digital technology to reach all citizens wherever they are and, you know, moving fast and not being perfect. So being able to make mistakes and, and fix them along the way, as long as we're listening to, um, as long as we're listening to our customers. So thank you. No, thank you. That's, uh, you know, as, as I'm having a conversation with uh, either technologists or folks who very much appreciate technology, I mean, you just hit on the core tenets of lean methodology, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, move, move quickly, stay nimble, uh, close the feedback loop or mm -hmm. tighten the feedback loop. And then ultimately the customer development process of listening to the folks who are actually using our products. Uh, that is textbook and it is encouraging to hear that that's what's happening in Connecticut. Um, so I wanna to jump to, to Michael Newsom in Pennsylvania uh, to share the same, you know, what's your digital portfolio look like? What areas do you touch? Uh, or what areas do you control that uh, the folks in Pennsylvania are touching? And then ultimately where are you heading and, and how has the coronavirus affected that? Oh, great, uh, thanks, thanks Ace. Um, yeah, we are uh, in uh, the Office of Administration our IT operations are centralized within our, our office. And over the years, we've uh, consolidated key infrastructure such as uh, data centers and telecom office. And in 2017, we set up a shared services model for staffing, uh, funding, and governance. We continue to model, uh, monitor the success of this model today and we've added more focused governance to require additional approvals to ensure consistency and to avoid duplication across the Commonwealth. In 2019, we embarked upon customer service transformation. Now our governor, Governor Wolf, uh, and I worked together and uh, he uh, has a long term experience as a builder, uh, as, a build, as a business owner and if I must say, a business innovator, uh, even with his family owned six generation building products business, he recognized the need to make um, significant changes to remain competitive and to set new standards within the business. For example, we were the smallest company in our industry that ran SAP ERP system. Now that said, he, he wants to transform how we deliver services to the people of Pennsylvania, online, over the phone, and in person. And he called on IT to work with his office to make this happen. Now, uh, if John, if you can add a little bit of uh, context to the work that we're doing with customer service uh, transformation, that would be helpful. Back in 2018, uh, the governor's office He's still frozen a little bit there. We're low on audio for you. Um, can you bump that up perhaps? Okay. And Michael, we'll pop back to, to you for a second. Um, as you think about coronavirus specifically, how has that affected the way that you're communicating, interacting um, digitally with, with the folks in Pennsylvania? 
well, yeah, in mid-March, I don't remember the date anymore, but the, the governor um, mandated telework for all that could telework within the Commonwealth. And we just basically shut down the Commonwealth. And at that time, we learned quite a few things about, us. You, you don't know what you don't know, right? And uh, so one of the things that we, we thought we had, for example, our VPN, uh, and, and we had certainly had enough capacity, we thought, but as we brought more and more people onto the VPN, we learned that uh, we had some issues there and that we had to, to, uh, to upgrade the, the VPN. So we learned from that and our IT group uh, was able to, to operate on the fly. I mean, as things came up, they reacted very quickly. Uh, I can't tell you how many hours. I mean, if folks worked long, long hours to make these things happen. So this pandemic, it's not only for PA, but for the entire world, changed the way we do things. And we had to learn very quickly. And, and telework was the main thing, but then just what we're doing right now with a Zoom meeting and we, we use Skype for the most part at the, in the Commonwealth. But we had to learn how to not only uh, deal with each, with each other in this type of setting and all, over the phone, in many cases not being able to see each other, but also we have trainings that we have to do we have uh, keeping folks up to date on what's going on throughout the Commonwealth. And we had to do all that remotely. So we've set up things, even in, on the HR side, they learn how to do virtual trainings and, and, and that type of thing. And we'll work closely with IT to make those things happen. Michael, much appreciated and, and really helpful context. I think that last piece that you, you touched on, ultimately the shift and figuring out VPN and, and having folks plugged in to make that transition to teleworking seamlessly, um, I, I think that shapes the next question. And I'm gonna pop to Chris for this one. When you think about the long-term implications, not only of the pandemic, although I think that's expediting our learning um, very rapidly, uh, what are the long-term implications of, of your digital infrastructure in Washington State? And how are you thinking about the future and perhaps future proofing as much as we can do in the digital world? Well, thank you for that question. Um, to exacerbate all the things that are going on, you've already mentioned um, COVID-19, budget cuts, freezes, and things like that. We're in the middle of doing an ERP now with an $8 billion shortfall and a very skeptical legislature. So building bridges to a long-term strategy is absolutely necessary so that we can connect with, with our citizens and regain the confidence of, of, this, of our state legislature. So those bridge, bridges we've identified are operational, financial, and procurement. We've done a great deal of research into what other states have done and taken away many, many lessons of how they've done their ERP, what should we include, forecasting what's going to be needed into the future. And so at the forefront of our EP, uh, ERP is the investment in AI technology and the natural migration to the cloud. I don't think this is any surprise to anybody, but it's, it's accelerated our, our use of the initial, um, in, initial uh, stages of AI technology, which are things like chat box to help speed up what we're, we're doing especially in, in our area of employment security. So in the meantime, we are still required to provide other things like employee assistance, employee education, workspaces and education to our schools. So we are still looking at what are the long-term strategies to doing this. We do not think that we're going to be in COVID forever, but we'll probably be in this situation for a, a fairly uh, long period of time who knows at this particular point, at least until we find a vaccine. So we need to find way, new ways to provide these services, whether they're through a SaaS applications, automation or enhancements to our web portal, allowing better access to contracts. And did I mention that $8 million budget shortfall? <clears throat> so we're trying to do all these things based on market research. We cannot afford to fall further behind in our transformation efforts as it would be a disservice to the citizens of Washington and the state workforce, which means we will need to work smarter and have clear roadmaps to success. So that's what we're trying to do in the, in the state of Washington. I think our, our story is well told by, by our vendors out there. 
Great. Thank you so much for that, Chris. Uh, you know, you touched on so many areas. Uh, out of curiosity, you mentioned uh, you did this scan of, of other states and how they're handling the ERP process. Um, anyone stand out? Do you have a, a one that you really liked and took some notes from? Well, we, we went to visit the state of Nevada. We liked what the state of Nevada was doing. We went to Michigan. We went to Pennsylvania. We went to North Carolina. We went to Virginia. You can see the list goes on and on. And we took notes away from, from all, those, uh, all those people who have done their ERPs. We even went to Canada to look at the Canadian solution and what their, their government was doing. And then we did an exploratory search in, in Australia to see the, the digital services that's being provided internationally also. So we took away lessons from all those things. I think once we get done with our ERP, because it's going to take us a while, It'll be very, very modern. I think it's going to transform the way we do government in Washington State. Great, great. Thank you. So a couple great shout outs there, uh, one of which was Pennsylvania. So I'm going to jump back to John and see if we've got some audio now. Um, John, some thoughts on, on moving into the future um, and making sure that your technology can keep up with you. It looks like we got you on mute. All right. So while we're doing that, we'll see if uh, we'll see if we can get John. John, my my promise to you is that we will do everything we can to get some insights from you as we're working through this. Um, but Michael, I'll pop back to you again. That that Pennsylvania shout out, I think, timely and appropriate, given that we've got you on the horn. Um, no problem. No, no problem. I can take that. Yeah. So moving into the future, and you know, Chris alluded to coming out of the pandemic, uh, which I, I I would imagine all of us expect to do. Um, I'd also imagine there, there will be some long-term repercussions. And so thinking four, five, even 10 years out, uh, how do you see technology shifting and, and what are you planning for down the road? Well, sure, let me say a couple of things. First of all, in, in March, at the onset of this pandemic, the, the first thing that happened to us, the budget office declared a freeze on non-essential hiring. And um, without giving you all of the woes of Pennsylvania, uh, we also started to, we, we eliminated some, some vacancies that we had, and these will be per, probably permanent eliminations of, of positions. Um, they basically stopped all procurement activity that uh, was not already in the works, not already approved or committed. So that's where we start. So in June, the budget office and our legislature uh, finally came up and enacted a budget, but it was only a five month budget. So we're talking short term now. So that's a five months for the fiscal year, which also indicated that we had some cuts that we had to deal with. And for the second portion of this budget, that seven month back end of the budget, we hope to have more information on what the fiscal outlook will be and perhaps uh, what additional federal aid will be available to, to us to, and other states. Uh, this this has made it quite challenging for our operations and helping as how we will manage through the next in the short term. Right. But when you want to think about it from a long term standpoint, we've learned quite a bit. In fact, during this, I, I had a conversation with the governor, and and we talked about some lessons learned during this this stay at home directive, and one of the lessons was that we've really learned that we can telework from home. Uh, from an IT standpoint, I wish John could get in because he and I have had lots of convers conversation about this, but from an IT standpoint, we're in the process of making a move. And this move involves, let's say, I'll throw some numbers out without giving you all the details, about a thousand employees. Well, we're learning now through telework that perhaps we don't need a workspace for a thousand employees. Maybe we could do with a significantly less than uh, that number of employees because of the telework situation. And as a result, we put a work group together to talk about what we, we call it the post COVID-19 work group. And let's talk about what our future will look like and the kinds of benefits and efficiencies we can get from what we've learned through this pandemic. And without giving all the details, think about the paper. We haven't generated very much paper at all uh, over this last five months. So do we still need a lot of paper? So we're talking about a, a digital 
record strategy and putting a policy together to eliminate a great deal of the paper that we're doing. But back to this move that we're talking about, we're looking at hoteling, a, an opportunity to, uh, to have spaces that employees will come to. They'll, they'll, make, they'll make a reservation, if you will, for that space for a day or two, and then they'll go back to the telework situation. Impact on staffing, impact on parking, and long, long term, we're gonna take a look at all the leases that we have within the Commonwealth to see as they come up for renewal, should we be retaining those spaces? So those are the kinds of things that we're working on that are great things we've learned from the pandemic. Great. Secretary John Don. There we go. Great. Right. There we go. So that is, that is perfect on a couple fronts. Michael, I appreciate that piece. And uh, you, know, you referenced the post-COVID uh, uh, working group. Um, I'm gonna stay in the COVID realm here for a second and I'm gonna pop to John because we've got audio from John now, your CIO. Um, I've got a question for both John and then Mark, I'm gonna pop to you uh, right after for the same question. But uh, John, you know, so many folks, especially those not in the tech world, but wrapping their head around new technology, uh, keep hearing about contact tracing. Um, so I, I wanna hear a little bit about the new tools in the digital realm that you've implemented through your COVID response in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, and then, you know, Michael alluded to some of the things you've learned, paperless, you know, we're, we're in this teleworking environment, perhaps putting less strain on the environment. Um, can you speak to some of the things you've learned from COVID response that will carry us beyond COVID? John, Absolutely. audio, awesome, love it. Good to hear you. Here we are, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for your uh, participation today. Uh, in terms of those specific questions, um, and without giving too much active procurement information away, contact tracing is something that Pennsylvania has been doing for years. Um, we are evolving to some of the new technology that is available on personal phones um, and on um, Commonwealth issued phones. I think everybody understands what that means. Proximity of Bluetooth devices, I think everybody gets that piece. Um, and what we are doing from a contact tracing perspective now is uh, relying on citizens to self-report to their public health officials so that appropriate contact tracing activities can proceed from there. Um, we have an existing automated system and we are looking to expand that to bring on more contact tracers. Currently we have about 650 tracers and we're looking to increase that number to about 4,000 all supported through automation and now correlation of events through that proximity idea. In terms of digitization, and I apologize for not being able to speak to it earlier, uh, similar to what uh, Connecticut is doing at Highmark, um, Pennsylvania adopted a digital uh, transformation strategy uh, in about 2018 and we've been building towards it. In July of 2019, the governor issued a, what we would consider a, a groundbreaking executive order um, called Citizen First. It has six design points in it, very similar to what Connecticut is doing, a single destination for online services, uh, common sign-in across uh, multiple channels, a consistent online experience. Again, think of it in terms of, does this look and feel like an official government service, uh, fewer domains, fewer websites, uh, fewer URLs, continuous service improvement based on integrated customer service satisfaction in applications and mobile apps. So Ace, I hope I answered your question. You did. I think, I'm, comple I think I'm completely caught up. <laughs> no, John, that was great. And uh, you know, there, there are a couple of themes there, you know, um, You've got some secret sauce in, in Pennsylvania, as, as other states do as well. And so being conscientious of, of what you share and where you share it is, I think, a big piece of this conversation. You know, being able to share some insights, it sounds like we've got a good network, as, uh, as you just said, hey to Mark. And so I'd imagine there's some notes being passed. And um, the second piece that I caught was the streamlining of processes, you know, cutting down on the number of URLs that folks have to navigate to, number of domains that you might have 
uh, across your portfolio. You know, pieces like that. And uh, as we kicked off, uh, Mark and Chris both alluded to the same. So um, I want to jump to Mark again. The the same question: What new tools have you kind of added into pandemic response? And what have you learned from pandemic response that will inform uh, how your portfolio grows or shifts moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, what, the, the word cloud a little earlier, I think, highlighted a lot of what uh, overall state learnings were, and specifically in Connecticut, that, you know, what people thought was impossible about remote work uh, really wasn't at all and, and just required the appropriate amount of leverage to go ahead and change. Um, and so, you know, basically overnight, making people, uh, allowing them to be productive for a variety of different roles that they have in a remote way uh, was largely the, the biggest impact of the pandemic. And, and as Michael, you know, was talking about, not just for now, but as it relates to future real estate and how it is that we work together. I will say that, you know, the, the events of the last couple of days where, you know, we uh, have a large amount of our uh, state without power, right? It's really stretched the ability to now think even somewhat differently about, well, you know, when it's not accessible, how do we continue to bring the productivity that we need and have become used to working remotely? Uh, a couple of other uses of technology that really blossomed for us, uh, social media and the interaction between government and, and our, our constituents using that platform has really taken off. So we have virtual meetings using Zoom, but public meetings where we have interaction with public. Our, our, uh, our governor does a daily streamed, you know, uh, update message uh, where you know it, it's it's all virtual and so you know not just broadcasting it but having interaction through those channels as well has re it really picked up uh, quite substantially uh, virtual call centers so we we uh, have a thousand people doing contact tracing uh, across the state and stood up a virtual call center and virtual telephony to help them do that so that they're not calling from their home phones but they're calling from a recognized and trusted number within the state. Um, we, we uh, before the pandemic, had no chatbot use at all in Connecticut, and now we have three. Uh, so, you know, one uh, related the, the, to our coronavirus page, which gets a lot of uh, activity, and then two relatively newer uh, settings with our uh, Department of Motor Vehicles and, and our Department of Labor around our unemployment insurance, but really trying to deflect some of the, the calls that come in and provide a more effective way for the people who want to engage with us in an online fashion, the ability to go ahead and do so. And I'd say the last, uh, the last technology that's really uh, took off for us was the, the, the single digital identity, right? And, and so as we, we launched our business one stop, you know, we were looking at, will, will people want to sign in or will they want that sort of generic, uh, you know, uh, anonymous experience. And what we were hearing from the people is that they want the trusted signed in experience, but they don't want to do this over and over to the different websites and web properties that we have in the state. They want that one way for us to know them and bring together, you know, across our different programs, the information that we have in a way that we're not using that data Right? but we're allowing them to use it, to pull it together and, and really assemble it for themselves and get a greater picture of how all of their different touch points with government. So, so that was a little surprising to us that they were really preferred that, that trusted experience and that, that logged in experience than just sort of uh, working with us anonymously. Uh, much appreciated, Mark. Um, while I have you, I want to I want to shift to a thread that I caught from uh, Chris, Michael, and John. You know, as budgets are shifting, hiring freezes. You know, you've got this constricted or or more constraints are being introduced, but you're expected to do more. You figure roughly 80% of folks have a, a smartphone in their hand. Uh, something like three quarters of folks have either a desktop or a laptop. You know, and you've got this opportunity to engage digitally as you think about implementing single sign-on, as you think about uh, natural language processing and training bots. You know, what is, what, what's that tension and how do you find the balance between we have less people to focus on, on different things that we might have had to restaff or shift 
um, the, the people we have around to get that work done. Yeah, that's a, that's a common refrain, you know, as we, as we talk to our agency commissioners and leaders, you know, who are, who are already under the gun for, uh, you know, their, their, their programmatic areas. Um, and, and our, our response is a simple one, right? That, that we, we, our digital interaction with our citizens is the most efficient way for both both us and them, for those that want to participate in that in that delivery chain, right? Because it's available whenever you want it, whenever it's convenient to you, um, and the the upcoming generation of digital natives just automatically use that as as a way of interacting. So so. Um, the more that we can shift that to the, the digital realm, uh, the more resources of our limited resources we have to, to work with people in, the, uh, in, in ways that they, they need for the, for the people who, because as governments we serve you know, the, the neediest of our, of our people. So you know, making sure that for those who need in-person interaction or, or over the phone interaction, that we're putting those resources to, to, to in place, but delivering more, as much as we can digitally helps us maintain that balance in a way that um, we, we absolutely need to. You've got uh, quite the job and uh, we appreciate you for it. Um, I wanna stay kind of on the topic of balance, uh, but I'm gonna jump over to, to Chris in Washington State. Um, as you balance the citizen-centric approach, um, how do we get the best pieces of technology into the hands of the people who need to use them? Uh, how do you kind of, how do you reconcile that or balance it with um, the internal bureaucracy perhaps uh, that slows down adoption of new technology at the state government level. You know, you need new things, you want new things, people want them in their hands, uh, but you might have some inertia to overcome uh, within state government. Thoughts? Well, I have to uh, say that uh, there's an old axiom that's out there, it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> and so we've been very lucky in the fact that we have uh, a technology leasing program in the state of Washington. We've had one for, I wanna say, probably about seven or eight years now. And so at the, at, uh, at the downturn of this pandemic, um, we actually turned to our leasing program and was able to get all the things that we needed to uh, help us modernize our now new mobile wor workforce. So that was one of the things. Plus, in addition to that, we, ha we had memberships in a number of cooperatives besides having a master contract system so we could access a number of different vendors and whoever could give us the best service or the best price, or maybe, maybe better service at an elevated price that our contracts would allow us to do. So while I would love to say we had all this forethought and planning ahead of time, actually it was built into the contracts that, that we did. It was part of our system or that already existed. And so now we're, we're using it. So, uh, a lot of these things, uh, too, that, that, that I'm mentioning about being lucky than good, some of this is, is actually not luck at all. So let me mention something that, that I think Mark mentioned about having the neediest. And that's the fiber optic backbone and the 5G networks and the F that the FCC is really arguing about. Uh, and I think all the CIOs can, can relate to this, um, to this discussion. Um, and so to serve the neediest uh, people and to serve the rural areas of, of our state where uh, actually one third of our entire population lives is we have to have this fiber optic. It, it's, the, it's, the, it's the backbone of everything that we want to do digitally going into the future and will bring everyone together into the digital world. Without that, you're still operating, let's literally say back in, in the uh, stone ages. So what we've done to, to balance that budget piece that you were talking about, there are two areas that we're not taking any money from. One is our procurement staff because they do the lion's work of doing the research on what we should be buying based on customer needs and customer interviews and making sure that we're not only serving state agencies, but our poly subs. Our poly subs are important to us because that 60% of all the services that we provide are to poly subs. And in many cases, it's 70% of all the services that we provide. And we're not cutting back on IT uh, budgeting. 
And basically the budgeting for IT is in staff. We need to keep those staff members working. We need to make sure that we have the right kind of staff on board. So we've decided to cut, cut in other places besides uh, IT staff and, and procurement staff. So that's part of our strategy moving forward. Great. Thanks again for that, Chris. Um, so we're almost at time. We're about to wrap up. But uh, Chris, a couple things you just touched on, um, namely some of the stats that you just shared. You just shared a, a fair amount of just data that you have on hand, and, and it's easy for you to recall, which is incredible. Um, but in some of our prep calls, John actually talked about the way that we communicate with citizens in our respective states. Um, and so I, I want to talk about data visualization really briefly. And uh, it seems like Pennsylvania is doing some great work there. So I'm going to jump to John and Michael to close us out for the panel in, in how you're making data and metrics and the things that you're measuring that are, are incredibly important to your citizens. How are you making that available? How are you making that palatable? And how are you uh, making, it, uh, making it pretty so we can see that data visualization? John and Michael, uh, for whoever wants to take that last question. I'll get started. Uh, and thank you, Ace. So a couple of things that we're doing. Um, one of the key elements of our strategy is publicly available information and transparency. And a couple of years ago, we established an open data program. So uh, many of our dashboards and data sets are available at data.pa.gov. So that's one thing that we're doing. We're also taking advantage of virtual assistants in the same way that Connecticut is to uh, integrate with uh, key programs like unemployment compensation. Now, to take it a step further, and this is something that I'm really passionate about, and I'll turn it over to Secretary. The idea of what we've gone through in the last four and a half months, I'm sure many of you can relate with the idea that a press conference, a news event, regardless of what it is, has involved some sort of spatially enabled data representation or visualization. That's IT speak for a map. <laughs> and almost every press conference, uh, whether it's Governor Wolf or uh, Dr. Levine, our public health official and Secretary of Health, has some sort of map in it. And so spatially enabled data, now is the time uh, and we see this as a big opportunity to help citizens, business entities, suppliers understand where we are and where we're headed. Secretary? Well, great. John, you must have been reading my notes because I uh, wanted to talk just something very similar to that. But let me, let me just summarize or, or, or give you one point uh, regarding that because you have IT talk and I'm going to put it down where the folks can understand it. We, as we look at data. Uh, and the governor did a number of press conferences. Our secretary uh, of health has done a number of conferences. They, they've talked about decisions that they've made and lots of data, lots of information available. But folks don't understand how these decisions are being made. So I'll call it data mining, but taking the data and making it Putting it out there is forcing us to explain the data to the, to the citizens. They understand what we're doing. Sometimes they don't know why we're doing it. And we just have to make sure we take this data, put it in such a, a, a format that they're able to understand it. And just one final point, as I went through my career with, with uh, finance and accounting and numbers, I always prided myself in being able to explain the numbers without using the numbers. And that's really what we need to learn to do with this data. Explain to folks what we're doing, why we're doing it, without inundating them with all of the data. But the data is important. So thanks for that, John. Michael, thank you for putting that in uh, layman's terms for us, um, as, as IT guys tend to just throw out jargon. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that home. Um, and, and the rest of the audience seems to as well, especially on that last point, uh, data visualization and telling stories. I saw uh, Sean from Michigan mentioned you have to tell the story. And I think that sums this up 
as a session very nicely. So I want to thank Chris, Michael, uh, John, and Mark for joining us and sharing some incredible insights. And uh, we're going to jump from here in the Richmond studio back to Jamie in Kentucky, I think, to take us to a uh, coffee breakout, if you will. Yeah, perfect. Um, it's so hard to pull away from this great conversation we are having. Uh, thank you guys so much for that uh, fascinating panel. Well, welcome back from the breakout. I hope everyone got to uh, turn on your video and turn yourself on unmute kind of shake up, uh, get a glass of coffee, and we are back from our breakout. So that was us trying to intentionally connect everyone, uh, really recreate uh, the atmosphere of an in-person event and say hi. So I am really excited to introduce this next session. We have both Andy and Ann and Rung from Amazon Business. And so Ann is the Director of Public Sector of Amazon. And so, Anne, I'm going to give you the floor so that you can introduce Great. your host and tell us about the session. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for joining today, and a special thanks to, to MASCA for providing this forum uh, to have this great conversation. And especially delighted to be joined by uh, three exceptional public servants from uh, Tennessee, Hawaii, and Wyoming, um, who we've had the pleasure of working with at Amazon Business. So our panelists today are Melissa Huck, with Chief of Staff with Department of Military Tennessee Emergency Management Agency. And I was reading uh, uh, Melissa's bio, and she's responded to more than 36 disasters. So very curious how this one ranks. Um, we're also joined by Bonnie Kahakui, uh, Assistant Administrator, Procurement Office, State of Hawaii, who brings more than 20 years experience in state government. And finally, uh, Dirk Dykstall, who's a JD, uh, and he serves as Section Chief with Health Readiness and Response in Wyoming Department of Health, who brings his private sector experience to the job. And what I love about this panel is that, um, you know, they're not only all on the front lines of responding to COVID, but uh, with their focus on emergency management and procurement and health, I think we're, we're going to get a nice 360 view of what it means uh, in the times of COVID to be innovative in order to keep pace with the, the urgent and important needs of our communities. And the word innovation, which is the focus of our discussion today in the times of COVID, the word innovation is often associated just with technology. You know, people think about building new products or new features, but Innovation is a lot more than that, and it can simply be a completely new way of doing things, new processes. Um, and for government, it could mean radically shortening the time to procure, which I know has occurred during COVID by streamlining uh, previously lengthy processes, or it could be turning to other channels like online marketplaces to help source and deliver scarce products. And what we're hoping to hear from our panel today is more about, you know, what are you doing differently to be innovative in the time of COVID? And um, also curious whether you think that may be the new normal um, long term, not just because we think COVID's going to be around forever, but um, has, have some of these innovations proven to be so effective that you're going to want to keep it long term? Um, and we also, of course, want to hear about some of the challenges and successes in innovating. And I'd say my observation from Amazon Business is that suppliers of governments have come together in a, a really um, nice way, in a more very strategic and I think innovative way to help respond to COVID. And you know, Amazon Business has grappled with, I think, many of the same challenges and questions as our government uh, customers. So. You know, how do we ensure our workforce remains healthy? How do we ensure the continuity of operations? And then how do we continue to provide a high level of service to our customers, in your case, the citizens? And, you know, these are certainly challenging in any environment, but especially so during COVID. Um, as I was saying, one of the things that we grappled with, I think governments grappled with, was, you know, how you prioritize customers. And we developed what I thought was a really sound methodology we'd, we would apply to uh, customers and thinking through, are they in a hot spot? Are they on the front line? Um, are they a state government that's coordinating on behalf of many entities? Um, 
But what we realized in execution was that methodology went right out the door because it wasn't scalable. We couldn't apply this methodology customer by customer. You know, how do you define a hotspot? Is it current or future? Is it per capita or total? And so we ended up really simplifying the process to identify segments of the population we knew were frontline responders like hospitals, um, state governments, and then simply whitelisting them. And they came into the store and it was first come, first serve. And we started small, you know, giving access to a small number of organizations and then, and then scaled um, from there. So in the end, you know, we were able to deliver, I think, 200 million products um, to frontline uh, responders, but um, we're still, you know, we're still grappling with how we execute on this. We, we're still finding our delivery isn't perfect, um, our technology is not perfect, and um, we're learning as we go. So we're really eager to hear from our three state customers just how uh, we can learn from you and uh, from the challenges that you've overcome or are overcoming. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Andy, uh, Chris Marizic, to moderate our panel, and hopefully you can hear Andy much better than me. Thanks, Andy. All right. Thanks, Ann. Yeah, actually, Ann and I were in the trenches, uh, literally meeting almost every day, sometimes on weekends from about mid to late March through mid-April, maybe late April, just trying to uh, through a daily stand-up, meet with other leaders uh, and other key stakeholders across Amazon Business to um, sort of grapple with the the, uh, the challenge that we had had to face with with COVID. And so, really, uh, what I asked our uh, state colleagues, our state partners, to do first of all, I want to say thank you myself to uh, to Bonnie, to Melissa, and to Dirk, uh, both for their partnership, uh, but also for making some time today to share their insights with their colleagues across the country. Uh, I asked them to share their COVID evolution story. So when did you first realize you had a problem? You know, sort of America, we got a problem um, or whatever your state, you know, would be. You sort of, okay, we have to address this. And then um, since you're all uh, involved with procurement, what were some of your biggest supply chain challenges early on in procuring COVID supplies? Um, and then what were your most reliable sources? Um, could include Amazon, could include other vendors, of course, uh, but just wanted to have that as your frame. We've asked each of them to share sort of, you know, three to five minutes of that COVID evolution story. And so we'll begin with Bonnie. Bonnie, are you with us and ready to, to share? Hi, yes, Bonnie. I just need to unmute myself here. Good morning and aloha everyone. I know it's afternoon for most of you. Uh, I've been asked to share a little bit of Hawaii challenges during this COVID pandemic. Like other states, we face shortages in almost every area. But unlike other states, uh, we are in a unique situation. We're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I, had, I don't think you probably don't either. Spread across uh, eight islands, 2,500 miles from the nearest landmass. So, hey, Bonnie, so, I, I want you to be interrupted. Ace, you were uh, on, uh, on mute. So, Bonnie, go ahead. Oh, OK. So, so being in the middle Pacific Ocean, almost everything we need has to come by ocean liner or has to be flown in. You know, we don't have the luxury of going to our next uh, neighboring state and tapping into their resources. So when we were faced with this emergency, we knew that we're, we were in for a lot of challenges. Uh, we were informed, we, we, you know, we heard the stories going on, but Hawaii was kind of isolated. We, didn't have a lot of cases for a long time. It was the ones and twos, but on March 15th, we were, we were given a stay at home order and we we're all home by March 16th. So it was a really fast and quick turnaround time. Uh, we knew that we were gonna be facing long lead times and exorbitant shipping charges. In some cases, whatever we were buying, half of that was shipping charges. So it was kind of be, it was crazy. Uh, not only did Hawaii face shipping challenges, but as one of the smaller states in terms of population, uh, we couldn't compete with the larger states. Frequently, we found ourselves outbid, not only in price, but in quantity. You know, we couldn't compete with the Texas and the Californias, uh, they just, our vendors told us, oh, Texas had a much larger order, so we're going to fulfill those first. So what we did is, I mean, we, our staff, we, we basically hounded our vendors to every day, multiple times a day, we need this, we need this, 
please uh, provide whatever you can for us. So we ended up with, you know, third party vendors. Some of them we weren't too sure about. We didn't have a lot of experience with, but we didn't have a lot of choices. So we, and we went to smaller vendors who could probably retool to make some of these PPEs. We had our staff calling fashion um, houses here in Hawaii, fabric distributors, asking them, can you make these uh, cloth masks, community masks for our, not only our staff, but for the public? We heard from the University of Hawaii that they had a 3D printer or someone had a 3D printer, so could you make masks uh, or face shields? That wasn't successful. They weren't able to do that. Uh, but we, tr we tried everywhere. We had a blueprint company who's making face shields. We went to our smaller distilleries asking them if they could make uh, hand sanitizers. Some of them could, some of them could not. Uh, but we just called around and, and did everything. And we were very surprised that everyone stepped up to the plate. I mean, we had local church groups making uh, masks. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't on the big scale that we needed, but they, at least they were able to provide for our local communities. Um, it wasn't only PPEs. Everyone is now looking for plexiglass for shields for their offices. We just had someone come in yesterday to put some shields up and it had been on order for almost four weeks. Everyone is looking for that. Uh, one of our staff members who's kind of a handyman went down to our local um, hardware store and bought plexiglass and he made it himself. And it actually saved us a whole lot of money too. So we're being very innovative. We're, we're calling around, asking everyone, uh, what can you do? What can you supply? Uh, we even called other, other states. Can you give us some, some help? Can you give us some resources? We relied on our organization, the National Association of State Procurement Officials, and they were able to uh, get some information, put up on their website some resources, which was very helpful. We didn't, we weren't familiar on specifications on, on masks. I never knew there were so many different kinds of masks, medical grade masks, community masks, I mean, N95s, KN95, I, we had no idea. So we had to rely on their experts. Uh, the our Department of Health had had some information, uh, but but they were busy with doing other things as well. So we relied on NASPO to get some of this information for us. What kind of disinfectants do we use? What are specification for body bags? I mean, as as gruesome as that sounded, we had no idea. So we reached out to other states. Uh, and anybody that could, you know, provide any information, what kind of resources, what, who do we go to, who even makes these kinds of things. Uh, so it was a real, it was a real steep learning curve. And fortunately and, and unfortunately, we have to learn it quickly. And so we're able to use this as we go forward. Um, we have to make matters worse. Uh, we, you know, there was rumors going around that Hawaii was going to have a shipping disruption in our container, container shipping. So not only now were we afraid of getting shipping in, our local residents were concerned about food, food shortages. So we, you go to Costco, they had no toilet paper, they had no um, hand sanitizers, they had no you know, the Lysol wipes, there were huge lines all everywhere. In a time where we were telling everyone to social distance. Uh, we were able to, with the help of the communities, uh, you know, squelch that rumor. So things kind of backed off, uh, you know, because we're so reliant 
on everything from food and gas and there are long lines at gas stations. It was, uh, it was crazy. In addition to that, we had, once we started ordering all of this equipment and all these PPEs, where were we gonna put them? We, we could store some in some of our warehouses, but we weren't prepared for, you know, dozens of pallets of face masks and ventilators. Uh, we kind of relied on our National Guard to help protect some of these shipments until we could get one of our local warehousing companies up and, read, you know, up and ready and set to go for, to not only to accept, uh, count, receive, and then turn around and distribute that. As far as resources, uh, we've had most successes with the Grangers. Uh, we've had success with uh, our body, body armor outlet, who normally you buy, you know, tactical equipment from, but they were able to step up to the plate. And, uh, and of course, Amazon. Amazon is our only online marketplace, but they've been proved to be very successful. Uh, originally, we did not make the COVID supplies accessible to all our staff or all our jurisdictions uh, statewide. We, wanted, we didn't want to be able to compete against ourselves. So we concentrated only to our leads who are working with the uh, Hawaii Emergency Management Association uh, Agency. But eventually, as things kind of trickled back or wasn't such a great rush, we did open that up and we did find our other agencies uh, able to buy in, in smaller quantities. Unfortunately, the state of Hawaii now is in a surge. Uh, we used to have we used to think 20 cases was bad. Um, now we're up to, I think the last count was almost uh, 200. And probably in some cases, that's still small numbers. But for us, that represents a huge, huge uh, surge. And we're looking at ways of now stepping back. Do we need to do shutdowns again? Do we need to do more things? But the governor and all our state leaders are trying to be innovative, trying to do whatever they, they can to open the state up. Uh, as you probably know, tourism is one of our number one industries. And without tourism, we are in uh, facing a lot of um, challenges. So we're trying to be innovative, trying to do uh, as much as we can to protect everyone still provide the social distancing and keep COVID from, from spreading. Uh, Andy, is there any questions that anyone might have for Hawaii? Well, I think what we'll do, Bonnie, is, by the way, thank you. Uh, that was wonderful. And what I want to say is, um, out, of, out of everything you said, I really, um, there was a moment where you talked about how churches were stepping up and the community was bonding together and people were doing whatever it took. And I think at a time when, we maybe otherwise feel that we're very divided. That gave me a glimmer of hope that, that there was a united effort. It made me feel like that's when we've been our best as Americans and we've, we've bonded together against a, you know, a common threat. And that really, that really was uh, inspiring to me, Bonnie. So thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now is move to Melissa and hear uh, Melissa's COVID evolution story. Then we'll move to Dirk and then we'll uh, open it up to questions. But thank you, Bonnie. Melissa, are you with us? Yes, Sandy. And um, thank you for this opportunity today to speak. Um, our hearing um, Bonnie speak, um, a lot of similar situations here in Tennessee. So we realized right off the bat, um, day one, our first phone call to vendors, that we had um, supply chain issues. Um, our issues were not only were we competing within our state, but that we were also competing with our sister states, with other states in the country, and then worldwide. Um, a few of our concerns were shipping, as Bonnie mentioned. Getting products from overseas were a challenge. Um, we in Tennessee were able to work um, long-term deals that are now becoming fruitful with shipping via sea. 
um, instead of flight, which was an interesting concept um, that we had not um, ventured into. One of the other challenges that we ran into was dealing with new companies. Um, I'm sure other states dealt with this. There were innovators and entrepreneurs standing up companies with PPE items left and right. And there was struggle dealing with those companies as they were not set up, whether it be financially or um, even with some integrity that um, and put the state in position of requests to upfront money um, or to wire money so that they could use that um, um, floating of, of money to be able to, to make the products. So we ran into several issues where we would spend a plethora of time investigating companies. Some of those um, did become fruitful. Um, some of those unfortunately took time away from our team and staff to focus on other companies or innovative ideas to be able to move forward. A few of the other challenges that we found were, um, as Bonnie also mentioned, was the quality and grade of material or supplies that we were getting. One of the innovative things that we also did is we partnered with higher education. We partnered with our Department of Corrections to make face shields, to make gowns, items that were not able to be secured and found um, close by or in a time frame that our public safety partners needed. A couple of the companies that we did um, strike deals with and had great partnerships, um, one was with Amazon. Um, Granger was another great company. Safeware, Fast and All have proven to be kind of our um, partners we've locked arms with. Um, we had um, great communication with Amazon during this event as they developed the COVID-19 online platform. Um, to be able to have an open line with the team there to develop what the need was on a user end and um, how to integrate and develop that to meet the needs of public safety across um, not just our state, but across the nation was something that we enjoy doing and continue to work with them as we move through this event. In regards to um, historical and innovative events here, one of the things Tennessee did um, we, we termed the pivot as our kind of our term for this event is we pivoted from dealing with a one-on-one -on -one relationship with our counties to centralizing all purchasing for not all 95 counties and jurisdictions, all of our public safety departments at the state level. So we partnered with a um, company here, Journeys, who does shoes. Some of you may um, be familiar with that in the Southeast. Um, was able to go in with their warehouse space and basically stand up a distribution center, which for Tennessee was historic. Um, through that, we developed online ordering processes for our communities. We are now um, adding K through 12, our public, um, public school system and non-public school system, partnering with them to develop teacher kits, um, that they can order, that we can supply. And what, what we have found through that, a challenge instead of one individual entity ordering as a state buying in bulk and whole partnering with the Amazons, with the Safeware and Fastenal, we're able to um, develop streamlined processes, ordering processes and fulfill their needs in a more quicker and um, a dynamic process than each individual entity working on their own. And I will close with this, we feel like Tennessee, we um, had a heads up on most states. Some of you may remember Tennessee had just been through devastating tornadoes 72 hours before our first COVID case. So our teams, our policy statute waivers for states of emergency were already in place that allowed us to transition and pivot to the COVID response quickly. And we, um, we think that that was a huge lead for us to get ahead of that PPE supply chain at the beginning. So Andy, that's kind of a brief overview from Tennessee. I'll turn it back to you. Great, thanks Melissa. And one thing I'll say is uh, early on, I think that's what uh, some other states were telling us in terms of the multi-emergency situation. They were saying, you know, this says, what did you say you're in like day 157 of, of this? I mean, it was, it was interesting that you had a count uh, you know the exact number of days, and you knew that relative to prior emergencies, and what was the longest prior emergency? It was something like in the 90s. 
And so you have this baseline emergency now that's ongoing. We don't know when it's going to end, but other states are grappling with, well, what do we do now if a, a hurricane comes or a tornado? And, and so I really appreciated your perspective and sharing uh, that you were kind of ready for that. And I think other states would probably want to follow up with you if, if they could and, and, and find out how um, you're applying any lessons learned there. So thank you, Melissa. And so finally, um, we have Dirk uh, Dykstall from Wyoming. Uh, been a great partner uh, working with a, uh, a few members of my team. And so, uh, Dirk, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks. I just want to thank Andy and Ann and then NASCA for this opportunity to speak. Um, what I would say, though, is I knew I was in trouble uh, when I took this position a little bit over a year ago. Prior to that, I was mostly a private practice attorney. And my wife was like, man, you're going to be able to oversee a decent portion of the Department of Health. What a cool job. And I was like, yeah, that's probably true so long as a pandemic doesn't happen. And here we are. But um, what I would say is that, you know, we kind of knew early on that Wyoming was going to be uh, a little bit of a struggle and would have some issues. Some of the underlying planning assumptions from the public health side of things is that uh, Wyoming is probably one of the more frontier states, if not one of the more rural states um, in, in the United States. Uh, we have a population of about 500,000. So that presents some unique challenges, but also some unique opportunities. Uh, you can go from you know, one city to the next and not see a person, probably see more cows than you would uh, people uh, for the next 40 minutes. Um, so there's just some very unique uh, issues that we had from our state. So listening to both Bonnie and Lisa, there's definitely a lot of similarities and probably Hawaii and uh, uh, Wyoming both feel pretty isolated. So we knew there was going to be a lot of challenges there. Um, you know, back as early as um, late uh, January that we were submitting orders through a lot of our traditional partners. And um, what we ended up finding is that a lot of those started getting back ordered and then back ordered or canceled. And a lot of that is uh, because, you know, our orders were smaller and they just, you know, the traditional partners that we worked with no longer could fulfill those orders. We're getting UTF or, you know, various other reasons uh, came through. So what I would say what did work and didn't work was um, fast deals just didn't work. Uh, we, we couldn't go with our traditional partners. It just wasn't coming into the state. Um, like Melissa said, um, I probably would get 40 or 50 emails in a single morning from not only new opportunists to the governor's office, uh, you know, adding on, I had this person who knows somebody or those type of opportunities that came in and um, vetting those were very difficult. So some of the success that we had early on was as early as early uh, March, we moved to a unified command structure and the state of Wyoming has never done that before. Uh, you know, usually for a lot of these response capabilities. It's usually head by a certain uh, agency, but we decided to move for a unified approach where, uh, you know, the Office of Homeland Security and a large portion of the Department of Health that I oversee, uh, basically were co-located in the basement of uh, Homeland Security for a while in the um, EOC. And um, that helped just streamline all the communication, all the information that came in, all the various types of opportunities that came in through the SNS, through FEMA, and then all the various different sorts. One thing we have an issue here in Wyoming is just personnel. I mean, right now we're looking at budget reductions that are significant and at the same time an influx of CARES Act dollars that this state has never really seen before. Um, so it's a very odd place to be in right now, but personnel, yeah, as I heard uh, previous speakers in the, the previous group said, you know, early on there was a freeze of hires and that happened to us very early on as well. So. Well, by uh, moving to a unified command group, we were able to uh, dedicate additional personnel that we wouldn't have normally on hand for any response. So we uh, got people in the room that knew the specifications early, very, very early in the process. So saying, you know, what is what is exact specification we would need for this type of individual that we're trying to help out? Talked about the underlying planning assumptions that we had earlier. Um, <laughs> public health thought we would only be helping public health responders not uh, supplying the whole supply chain for the state of Wyoming for PPE. Uh, that was one of the bigger issues we had too. So getting someone in there early saying this is exactly the types of products you need uh, was huge. Also having a dedicated team uh, of individuals internally that was constantly checking uh, on prices, demand, um, and just vetting all of these different offers that were coming in helped us start really creating, okay, what is a decent deal and what's not, what's a fair price, what's not. Um, so all those different types of processes that we set up early really, really paid off. Um, one of the other things that was huge was we didn't make a deal with anybody until we got a sample. Um, Wyoming just, we knew we weren't going to get those fast deals. We just knew that this problem wasn't going to be solved in two weeks. We weren't getting to fulfill the demand in two weeks. 
Um, so we started working towards more long-term deals. You know, I, I think the pitch that I had on the phone most of the time when I was doing this was, look, I don't need this problem solved today, tomorrow, or in two weeks, but if we can strike something, uh, you know, a month out, two months out, um, that's when we got successful. And that's when we really started turning the curve on the demand and being able to actually supply uh, people um, statewide. Um, so those were really two big things. And then the final thing that I'd probably end on is, the resources from our just neighboring people in uh, similar situations was huge. Um, uh, just reaching out to you know neighboring states saying, hey, have you used this person? Have you used this source? What are, what are you guys doing? Just even taking two seconds uh, just to make that call. It was very surprising how someone in a similar position that I had, I frankly met back in October in one conference was willing to get on the phone at eight o'clock at night and chat with me for half an hour of what they were doing. And that was successful. Um, just sharing one quick story that really illustrates how this panned out. We had one of those deals that Melissa talked about where uh, very promising on the surface, sounded like he was a vetted partner, came in uh, promising kind of the world to us. Uh, and we did some due diligence and asked for samples uh, for the different types of products that they were going to supply us with. And it wasn't until I called one of our counterparts down in Alabama and never met the guy before, but just talked to him and said, hey, have you ever dealt with them? They, you know, the order form they gave us actually still had Alabama on there before they changed the um, offer to us. And he said, oh yeah, we looked at them and definitely don't go with them. And we were able to not move forward with that deal, luckily. And another state got trapped into that and it was kind of a big deal um, at the time. So just what I would say is reliance on uh, partners and just being able to get on the phone and have a conversation with someone else in another state that's in a similar situation was huge. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dirk. Um, actually, because you and Bonnie both said that, um, I wanted to, I didn't have this in one of our original questions, so sorry if I'm dropping this on you all, uh, you know, spur of the moment, but um, Bonnie, you said, and I like that you shared, Dirk, a specific story uh, about reaching out to Alabama. Uh, Bonnie, you said you reached out to other state partners. Do you have a more specific story that you'd be willing to share as an example of how you uh, cooperated with, uh, with other state counterparts? Well, I know that we did reach out to actually Washington, uh, D.C. They were going to put out a, a solicitation for, uh, I, I don't recall exactly which PPE or maybe it was all of them. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't work because they wanted a commitment of I think it was like 500,000 of something, and we weren't able to commit that far in advance, but at least we got a good idea of, you know, there's the specifications, what vendors were out there that could provide these things and tap into them for the smaller quantities or, or uh, get them on board so that we can have future conversations with them. Great, thanks, Bonnie. Melissa, same question for you. Absolutely. We partnered with um, our sister states to look at going in together for larger purchasing. Um, unfortunately, that was not um, fruitful, but it was an option that we looked at to collaborate together with vendors for larger purchases. Lisa, can I stay with you? Since one of the questions, um, it's from Jamie at NASCA. Uh, she says it's fascinating about how do you vet new partners. Uh, same was true for Dirk. Um, she said, interesting from Tennessee about how so many of the new vendors took more time. Is there anything you uh, learned from vetting new vendors that you would apply going forward? Um, is there some way that you think you would maybe expedite that? Um, and I'm thinking specifically in the direction of how do you get your economies going again by buying from maybe local, um, you know, or, you know, Tennessee or Wyoming or Hawaii based uh, sellers to the degree that that's possible. Yes, so um, we found that um, it, it took us about a month or so. What we did is we set up a unique um, email address um, because as Dirk mentioned, we were inundated of friends of a friends or they had connections and um, email boxes were getting overridden with new contacts that you could not get to the meat of what we needed to do. So we did auto reply, set up an email box and we actually partnered with what is called Launch TN, which is an entrepreneurial um, uh, program within Tennessee. Um, unfortunately, it took us 45 days to get our hands around that. I wish we would have started it earlier, but they actually were able to set up a form stack um, in collaboration 
with um, our agency and our Department of General Services. And we pulled um, actually National Guard administrative staff on board to help us vet those um, companies because we wanted to use Tennessee based or United States based companies. And we actually were able to find some, though the lots were small, they were able to help us out and we were able to um, take that time to um, look into them a little bit more clearly. Great, thanks, Melissa. Bonnie, how about you? Um, do you have to vet new vendors? Um, I know you said you, you had some, some local uh, companies maybe that were pitching in, but as you did outreach to other states or in just, what was your experience of vetting new vendors? It was difficult. Most of these vendors are not here in Hawaii. So we didn't have any kind of background information on them, but we, we developed a system or at least the staff did to you know check them out we checked all kinds of resources done in bad brad street we checked chambers of commerce we checked other states contracts or checked with other states do you have a contract with them so we had to go through that whole process to see if if these guys were real or not Dirk, you requested samples, which I, I loved. You know, like, hey, we're not going to work with you unless we can actually see the physical product. Um, anything else that you did to ensure uh, that you were going to get the quality selection, quantity, right. delivery speeds that uh, you required? Uh, you know, to be honest with you, early and often, some of it was just based off relationships. If someone sent it on the phone, okay, and then the sample turned out, then that was, you know, very early on. After that, we took a little bit more time and started doing investigations into the companies. And um, quite frankly, we just didn't take the risk of turning to someone that looked like a venture capitalist that pivoted from, you know, being an aviation company to uh, PPE. We just uh, we just made the risk analysis and moved on. Um, so that was just how we did it. Hopefully, we never have to go through that again. And luckily, as um, you know, vendors become back to normal, it's been okay. You know, honestly, the um, marketplace is a little bit expanded and as new vendors such as Amazon that have, you know, unique and very easy uh, customer service side of uh, dis distributions, I just hope we can get out of the whole procurement game from the Department of Health standpoint uh, for the whole supply chain. That's kind of the long-term strategy that we're looking at is, you know, making sure that our customers are who we're, I guess, for lack of a better term, customers right now, are successful on their own. And that's really what we want to return to uh, as soon as possible. And uh, hopefully we don't have to continue to vet uh, individuals or companies. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, Mark Howard, um, well, there are actually three names here, Mark Howard, Alvarez, maybe four names and, and Marcel, maybe that's a family, it's a family affair here. Um, but there's a question, uh, what are the innovative practices? This is one of mine as well. So. Uh, reinforces a uh, you know, thought that I had here, which is what are the innovative practices you think will continue and be expanded that you've learned uh, from this pandemic experience? Uh, we'll go to you, Bonnie. Okay, so we've always been part of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. And we have, they have just probably like all the other states, a web EOC. But we, what we've done is within our own group is create our own lead and uh, take advantage of that using all the tools available, technology tools available to us, Microsoft Teams and those good things to make sure that we're all in, we're all keeping in touch with whatever happens and uh, networking even more with other states and other organizations that could probably step in and help us, you know, get over whatever needs that we, we currently have. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, Melissa? For Tennessee, one of the innovative pieces that will remain with us is, is two parts. One is the centralized collaboration for our state for purchasing. Um, it is something unique that we have done individually before, but building the trust with our local government, um, county government, city governments, non-for-profits, even our medical community in some instances that um, we, we're, we're supporting together. And the second part would be the innovative um, 
um, idea from our team using specifically Survey123 as our online ordering platform has been um, fruitful. It has been collaborative. It has been efficient as we transition from an ordering to a, a um, pick list to an actual shipment plan. It is something that we are already looking to incorporate into our catastrophic logistics plan for other events that may come through Tennessee. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Dirk, what are the innovations that will endure? Gosh, um, one of the innovations that didn't endure is we still do 213 requests for everything. Uh, and Melissa <laughs> probably understands that. So every request we get for PPE still has a hard copy 213, which is really interesting. Um, but in terms of long-term process, I really hope that we can move to an online uh, ordering platform, um, you know, and also kind of separating the middleman. We serve here as a middleman for a lot of the ordering requests uh, and, and bringing it into the state. Again, what we want to transition to is getting from, you know, a, really the state being the supply chain here and moving it back into the private marketplace. So as hospitals uh, go back online and hopefully their vendors return to normal, also provide them other opportunities. We've done this a number of times with different uh, organizations, even state agencies, where we're either we're bringing them into our own whitelisted accounts, uh, such as through Amazon and through some other uh, vendors, but also turning that out to the hospital associations, to the primary care associations, and trying to bring them in into one account or bringing them into the fold of, you know, getting back into the private marketplace so that, the, you know, there's not a, such a reliance on really the government to uh, be that supply chain. And hopefully that's that's the long-term goal that we really want to get to. Great, thanks, Derek. Well, NASCA, we're at about 4.40. Do we have some uh, extra time here or should I be landing the plane? Yeah, I think if you want to put a final bow on it, that would be perfect. And then what we were going to do is we were going to send everyone into breakout so we can really dive in and let people uh, talk. So any kind of final bow on that, um, Andy and Ann, and, uh, we've learned so much from Hawaii, from Tennessee, from Wyoming. So Andy, big picture, bring it home. Well, you know, I'm gonna turn that over to Ann as our public sector leader, but first let me say again, thank you, Bonnie, Melissa, and Dirk uh, for your time today. Uh, that was fascinating. I know we did some prep calls and I learned a lot then and I learned even more today. And I'm sure that all of your colleagues across the country did as well. So, and I'm going to give you the last word. Thanks, what are your Andy, thoughts? And thanks. Yeah, thanks, Andy. And thanks to our panel. Um, yeah, it was interesting because at the beginning I had said, you know, we're, what I liked about this panel was we were going to get a 360 view because of the different functional areas. I hadn't quite appreciated also the 360 view because of the different regions. Um, and sort of the, the extraordinary challenges of, uh, of Hawaii, for example, being an island. Um, I think the common themes throughout that I heard around innovation that I think have some staying power are certainly around this idea of a unified command structure, which I know David Yarkin's on, on our call today, he and I both worked in the state of Pennsylvania, and that was something that we worked towards uh, having a sort of central procurement team. Um, certainly this notion of uh, there are supply chain challenges end to end and maybe thinking and turning towards non-traditional suppliers um, or channels for some of those solutions. Um, I think the theme of public-private partnerships was underscored here and we talked a lot about that in, when I was in government. Uh, but I think you're seeing that in an extraordinary way now in COVID. And um, as I said at the outset, like I, I see these partnerships being much, the discussions being much more strategic. Um, and I hope certainly that's something that continues as well. So thank you again to our panel and to my colleague Andy, and of course to NASCA and all the participants today. Yeah, thank you so much, Anne. Um, strategic procurement. It's not something that gets talked about a lot, but we, it was really tested and stress tested uh, during this pandemic. And I think it was Tennessee talking about just the multiple layers of disasters kind of compiled upon each other. So it really tested everything about procurement, about acquisition, about the supply chain, and really uh, thinking through all that. Here comes everyone back into the main session. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm seeing your faces. I'm seeing Kevin from Pennsylvania. I'm seeing Katie from Illinois. I'm seeing Mark from A&M. Welcome back from the main set to the main session. We are almost done here. So I thank you guys so much. I hope you guys got to meet someone from another organization or another state, but I want to hand over the mic to a few people. So I think from the first group, uh, Nina or Mark, I'm going to go ahead and spotlight Nina. 
since we haven't heard from you and unmute Nina to say like, how'd your group go? There's Nina. Yep. Hi, Nina. Anything big, high level that you heard or anything you want to summarize? Yeah, you know, I think um, we had a really rich conversation um, across a few states. And I think the, uh, the one thing that really stuck out to me is just how uh, collaborative, uh, you know, the uh, efforts have been. Uh, that sounded like it was a common theme across uh, in coming together to address some of the biggest concerns that we've probably seen and the biggest challenges that we've probably seen in our generation, uh, in our daily work. And so it was an opportunity to yes, address these challenges, but it was also an opportunity to bring closeness across divisions and departments and agencies to address these challenges together. And my hope is, is that that continued cross communication and uh, you know, just uh, uh, that collaboration will continue um, and, and there'll be less sort of silos across those decisions, but more together uh, in, the, in, the, in the service that, uh, that, that is provided, both for, for the employees uh, that serve in the states, um, as well as to the, to the people that they serve as well. Thank you, Nina. You guys, you always put it so well. So good to see your face. Hope all is well um, out in California. So good to see you. What about Jane from Evalua? What about your group? And we're spotlighting you and unmuting you. Yeah, I see you. There I am. Hi. Yeah. Um, yeah um, uh, in, in actually both sections, um, you know, the first piece on digitization and obviously the second, um, just really, uh, the, again, to echo Nina's, um, ours too. Just, um, I think what really came out of it is that people are really, um, open to trying something new um, and just giving it a try and and seeing where the you know seeing what happens and 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 then you know kind of taking that opportunity to continue to um, to use the means that we have um, collaborating uh, you know utilizing zoom uh, and and really uh, expanding that level of communication. Um, whereas before, I think, you know, we all kind of, you know, we all kind of are in our buildings or we're in our, you know, in our space. And this situation has really um, allowed folks to just not be afraid to pick up the phone or, you know, to tap somebody and say, hey, what are you doing? And how are you doing it? And, um, and can I try it too? And, and I think that, um, and, and across the you know, across the country, uh, just really emphasizing that, you know, folks are, you know, they're willing to jump in and help. Um, and now folks are really open to asking the question uh, that I, you know, I, not that they weren't before, but they're really impelled to, to take it to the next level. Thanks so much, Jane, picking up the phone. We heard so many people just calling other states, uh, calling the private sector. So thank you for that summary. And so we also, um, Andy, one real quick from your group, and then we're going to launch an evaluation question, and we are going to head out. All right, one quick insight that was very specific was the use of purchase cards to be more nimble uh, and to more quickly uh, identify needs versus going through what would otherwise be a typical, you know, procurement system or procurement process. So just wanted to highlight that. A couple of different people uh, from states highlighted that as a best practice. Yeah, more authority, getting those purchase cards and giving more authority there. So thank you so much um, to everyone that has stayed on today.